Hey, 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 apes, welcome back. And here is to another unit with Miss Hoskins. This time we're on water pollution, my favorite. Water pollution is five parts. First, we're gonna talk about wastewater from humans and livestock, and then talk about the heavy metals and other chemicals that can uh, pollute water. Uh, we'll have to def definitely mention oil pollution. Um, and then non-chemical water pollution, which is, which is an interesting topic. And then we're gonna wrap it all up with legislation. You guessed, water pollution laws. Besides sewage, you can also have heavy metal poisons and other chemicals that can get into the water system. So by the end of this, we need to be able to explain the sources of where those heavy metals um, come from um, and how they affect organisms, really. And also discuss the sources and effects of acid deposition um, and acid mine drainage. It's also part of it. And also explain how synthetic organic compounds can affect aquatic organisms. So heavy metals are a group of chemicals that can, you know, really be a problem to human health and they threaten humans and other organisms. Um, we need to focus on three heavy metals that are particular concern, uh, lead, arsenic, and mercury. So lead is rarely found in nature, as in, especially in sources of drinking water. Um, but it contaminates water that passes through those lead pipes um, and other materials that contain lead, like brass fittings and the solder that's been used to fasten the pipes together. So <clears throat> fetuses and infants are most sensitive to lead, and the exposure can basically damage their brain, nervous system, and even their kidneys. There's a series of federal guidelines for building and constructing um, and implementing um, any type of any type of uh, plumbing and housing in the past three decades or now there's been a lot of requirements for installing like lead free pipes and pipe fittings and pipe solders and these changes have basically increased um, you know through uh, water filtration systems and, and many homes have gradually basically reduced the problem of lead in drinking water period you know but there's still some concern out there especially in older houses and apartments Arsenic is a compound that occurs naturally in Earth's crust, and it basically dissolves in groundwater. And so as a result, this natural occurring arsenic in rocks can basically lead to high concentrations of arsenic in groundwater um, and even in drinking water. So human activity also contributes to higher arsenic concentration in groundwater. Groundwater, I'm sorry. So, it, for example, <clears throat> mining breaks up rocks deep underground. And industrial uses of arsenic for items like wood preservatives, um, and you know that can basically add to the amount of arsenic that's found in our drinking water. Fortunately, <laughs> arsenic can be removed from water. And there's actually like a fine like membrane filtration system. We can also use a uh, distillation, and um, one of the more uh, newer ways is the reverse osmosis process. <clears throat> And mercury, that's another naturally occurring heavy metal that is found in increased concentrations on water as a result of human activities. And mercury it can be released in different regions of the world, um, but it's activated by, like, burning coal and fossil fuels. Now, you know, amongst the world's regions, about 6% of humans um, produce... Um, I'm sorry, mercury production comes out of North America, and... Uh, you know, more than half of it comes from Asia and about 28% from China. So you can see here in this, um, in this illustration that, you know, indicated on here are high concentrations of arsenic that have been found in well water uh, throughout, throughout our country. You can see that um, the Midwest and West, arsenic in drinking water is associated with cancers and um, skin cancers, lung cancers, um, even in the kidneys and bladder. So <clears throat> these illnesses take like 10 years or more of exposure to develop. And even though low concentrations of arsenic exist, uh, those that are found in many wells, especially wells that are specific to a household, um, you know, people are still exposed to that, even at parts per billion at a time. And even small parts per billion can also have an effect and cause severe health problems. In fact, um, 
there are thought to cancers that can develop with less than 50 uh, ppbs of arsenic in drinking water. So 50 parts per billion was set as the upper like safe limit for U.S. drinking water um, from like 1942 to 1999. But in 1999, the EPA lowered the upper limit to 10 ppbs. Um, that was because there was a compromise reached after much debate between the environmental groups that were pushing for five PPB in water. Um, and that was just due to like mining and basically wood preservatives <clears throat> that were being used in the industry. And, you know, and by 2001, the EPA had delayed the implementation of that 10 parts per billion standard. Um, so that basically more work could have been done during that time period. Anyway, years later, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences uh, now recommends that the standard is 5 ppb, and the EPA decided to implement a standard of 10. As a result of all of this, um, substantial investment has um, been required to improve many treatment facilities to bring down the PPB of arsenic in water. And so the problem of arsenic in drinking water worldwide it is an issue. From like the 80s to the 90s, um, water engineers in lots of regions, especially like in Bangladesh and eastern Bangladesh and in eastern India, um, they drilled millions of very deep wells in an attempt to find a source of groundwater that was like not contaminated because their local pollution was so bad. And, well, this had, you know, a desired effect here for obtaining, like, less polluted water. Officials were not aware that the deeper the groundwater was, um, the more contaminated it was by naturally occurring things like arsenic. Because um, that stuff, again, occurs in rocks underground. Uh, so you can see here, as mercury emissions from human activity, that, that varies greatly among regions of the world. Um, this data, I think, you're looking at is from 2013. Um, besides um, coal burning, there's other important sources of mercury um, that come from like in the incineration of garbage and any sort of hazardous waste. Anything that's like metal and dental supplies produce mercury, mercury waste. Um, one of the less well-known sources of mercury comes from the raw materials that go into manufacturing cement for construction sites. Uh, the limestone that's used to make cement can contain a lot of mercury. And this mercury is released during a heating process that's needed to make that cement. And so the source of the heat for the cement manufacturing is often coal. <laughs> so in addition, that's actually, um, that releases even more mercury um, when we heat the limestone from coal. <sighs> About 40 years ago, people thought that the northeastern United States and northern Europe, China and Russia, um, they began to notice that like all the forest, soils, lakes and streams were becoming more and more acidic. <clears throat> as, a, as a consequence, some trees were killed and then some bodies of water became too acidic to really sustain fish. After much debate, it became clear that the source of this lowered pH of water was because of a presence of... Um, coal burning power plants. These very tall smokestacks of these industrial plants were burning coal and then release, releasing like sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide back into the air. And these tall smokestacks kept that emission um, away from local residents, but they sent the chemicals um, into the atmosphere. And that was all converted into sulfuric acid and nitric acid, as we have talked about um, in the air pollution section. And so acid um, deposited on Earth's surface as rain or even snow or as um, or even in the form of gases, I guess, and particulates, um, they basically attach to surfaces of plants and soil and water, and we basically call that acid deposition. Now, we've talked about this before, but wet acid deposition, also known as acid precipitation, or commonly called acid rain, it occurs in the form of rain snow, whereas dry acid deposition occurs in like gases and particulates that attach to surfaces of plants and soil and even like the surface of water technically. But acid deposition reduces the pH of water bodies from about 5.5 or 6 to below 5, which can be lethal. Um, to most aquatic organisms anyway, leaving these water bodies basically devoid of all living species, period. 
All right, so to combat the problem of this acid being released into the atmosphere, many coal burning facilities have installed um, coal scrubbers. And these scrubbers basically pass the, um, the gases produced by the plant into a, um, uh, a, a combustion process and that goes through like a limestone slurry, essentially. This limestone reacts with the acid gases and removes them before those hot gases leave that smokestack and they go into the atmosphere. So, you know, we're going to look at this issue, um, acid deposition in, in greater detail here. But basically, lower pH in the water bodies also occurs when acid um, comes from the ground, too. Synthetic or even human-made compounds can enter the water supply through an industrial point source. And that's when it's applied over like a large area. So these organic and carbon-containing compounds include things like pesticides, pharmaceuticals, um, military compounds even, and industrial compounds. And these synthetic organic compounds, they basically have a variety of effects on organisms. You know, they can be toxic and they can cause even genetic defects. And in some cases, they can be responsible for <laughs> um, resembling animal hormones and interfere with growth and sexual development. But pesticides in particular, um, they serve a, an important role in helping control pest organisms um, and they help control our um, or help crop production, right? And good crop production is good for human health. You know, pesticides, they serve an important role in helping control all of these organisms that, you know, pose a threat to our crops. So although there's some natural pesticides, um, like arsenic, um, they've been used for centuries. Uh, the first generation of synthetic pesticides were developed during World War II, and we've discussed those before. But basically, these chemicals provide um, a, a very effective way of killing a variety of these undesired um, plants that live there, um, fungus and insects. They're also commonly called herbicides, um, fungicides, and insecticides. And so in the decades after World War II that followed, these environmental scientists have basically identified a number of concerns um, that from these pesticides, insecticides, and fungicides, um, even though humans didn't really intend on this being an effect, it has been. You know, most pesticides, they don't target a particular species, but they're like a general killer. Um, and they kill a ver wide variety of related organisms. One example I can think of is an insecticide that is sprayed to kill mosquitoes, you know, is typically lethal to many other species of invertebrates and even insects that might be desirable um, because they could be like predators of the mosquito. So <clears throat> some pesticides are lethal to even things that are unrelated. You know, researchers have um, recently discovered that there's an insecticide called uh, endosulfin, um, and that's a chemical that was designed to kill insects. And it's highly lethal to amphibians, um, even in a very low concentration. So even though pesticides are not directly lethal to a single species, they can pretty much affect organisms by altering, you know, the species composition of the community. And these synthetic pesticides are generally designed to specifically target, like, pests, in theory, even though they don't. Um, the most insecticides target, like, the nervous system of a particular pest, and they can have um, usually unintended impacts on other things, you know, like the, like the amphibians. So one insecticide that comes to mind um, is DDT. All right, so DDT is a good example of something that was designed to alter um, nervous, you know, nerve transmissions in insects. And it's a chemical that basically moved up the aquatic food chain to all the way to eagles <laughs> that consumed fish. And eagles that consumed DDT contaminated fish, they produced eggs without that thin, um, with much thinner shells. And they would prematurely break during an incubation period. So even though, even though, despite the fact that DDT was designed to kill mosquitoes, it unintentionally impacted the thinning of bird eggshells. And so after the U.S. had banned spraying DDT in 1972, the bald eagle and other birds of prey, you know, adversely, um, had an increase in numbers. DDT is still manufactured, 
and it's used on developed nations, and it's sprayed in developing countries. It's one of the very preferred ways to control mosquitoes, because mosquitoes also carry deadly parasites like malaria.